so I want to talk to you today about um, a couple of ideas I've been kicking around about online speech regulation. And um, I think that we've kind of been thinking about uh, similar uh, issues around here. So I hope to throw out just some provocations and um, prompt a bit of a discussion. So let me first um, kind of tee up where I'm coming from on this. So as Audrey said, I'm a legal academic. I'm gonna be joining Northeastern, so different part of the country, but I'm equally excited. Um, so I'm a, uh, I'm a legal academic. I work, work on First Amendment issues, um, but I'm also a comparativist and I'm trained in German and uh, US law. So my lens is kind of a comparative uh, free speech law perspective. And so looking at you know, online uh, speech regulation um, has been has been interesting and 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 challenging. So it's become a key concern for for lawmakers in several countries. Um, and you might have noticed that regulatory efforts are are being met with you know significant criticism, in particular in transatlantic perspective. Um, and I suggest that there's a real danger here, and that is that those who criticize the European approach to online speech regulation sometimes, I'm not saying all of them, but sometimes um, merely fall into this trap of trying to relitigate um, old debates over the permissibility and extent of regulating speech. Um, and that's, right, and that's not a critique of online speech regulation. It's just the extension of a discussion that's been waged in the comparative literature for decades. And so here's my, um, here's my provocation. So I would argue that the normative balance between speech protection uh, and speech regulation as a constitutional matter has been struck in different ways around the world, uh, both on the national and the supranational levels. And this fundamental balance is unlikely uh, to be upset by new speech mediums. All right, I see you are all outraged at this point. <laughs> Okay, so let, what does that mean? So let, let me take a concrete example. So there's a new German law, it's called the Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz. That's the short title. <laughs> and uh, we call it NetzDG, okay? So that law aims to better enforce the country's existing hate speech prohibitions and other criminal code prohibitions on social media platforms. Okay, so it takes an existing legal regime and it tries to implement it online. And so what's, you know, predictably perhaps, one of the main critiques of the law, it's Germany censors speech. All right, so let me just take a step back, um, pause for a second, and point out that I think that censorship is a super unhelpful term in this context. All right, so like Jack Balkan, for example, I prefer this, the term speech regulation over censorship. So Balkan notes that uh, people generally consider censorship to be impermissible, but not, not all regulation of speech is unjustified, right? And I think that's exactly right, and we regulate speech all the time, right? So fraud, true threats, child pornography, right? You get the idea. So, and in comparative perspective, there's another layer of why censorship isn't, anal isn't a um, analytically helpful term. So typically, most constitutional regimes outside of the United States protect freedom of expression subject to certain limitations. Right? And the constitutional text typically includes a limitations clause. And I'll give you two examples. Um, one is the European Convention on Human Rights and the other one is from the German Basic Law. Um, all right, so here you have the European Convention on Human Rights. And you see that everyone has the right to freedom of expression, but then you see this typical um, non-US right, limitations clause in section two. So everyone has the right to freedom of expression, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then the exercise of these freedoms may be subject to restrictions as prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic society. And what that means, of course, is subject to interpretation by the European Court of Human Rights, and there's a rich case law on that. The point is that it's very clear that there are limits on free speech. So here's the same thing in the German basic law. Everyone has the right to freely express whatever they want. And in fact, there's no censorship. Um, but then you see the limitations clause again, 
um, in section two. So these rights find their limits in the general laws and so on and so forth. This is completely unremarkable as far as constitutional drafting around the world goes. In fact, this is what most constitutional provisions of that sort look like. All right, so back to Nets DG. So remember the idea was that the law's goal is to replicate existing criminal code provisions online. That's what the law tries to do. It does that in a really annoying way if you look at the statute because um, it just lists all of the provisions of the criminal code without explaining what they are. Um, so I tried to be nice and made a list for you. Um, so, um, so that's a list of all the crimes that are addressed in Nets DG. But as you notice, I said, these are existing enumerated provisions out of the criminal code, right? So these things are already illegal if you do them offline. This thing just says, whatever you can't do offline, please don't do that online. Okay, not please, but it's, you know. Um, okay, so you can't do this stuff offline, don't do it online. So one very common criticism of this law, which is uh, of, of NetCG, is that Germany prohibits hate speech and the US doesn't. Well, that's true. But that's, all you, uh, that's also really, really, really old news. Um, and I, so I suggest that drawing out the old debate over whether to regulate speech in the first place is really unhelpful in trying to design or assess new regulatory regimes for online speech, and it actually obscures deeper theoretical concerns that are raised by um, the nature of online speech. So where does that leave us? So we have different sets of free speech values, um, and those free speech values will be expected by supranational and national governments and their citizens to be equally applied online and offline. That's the whole idea I was just talking about. All right, so national or supranational legal systems that have struck the balance uh, in favor of hate speech regulation, for example, will s try to seek such regulation to be mer merit online as well. That's the Nets DG example. I'm not trying to say it does so successfully or even constitutionally from a German perspective, right? So the, the point isn't this is great, the point is just, this is not at all surprising. Um, so you have a, have a set of rules that governs life elsewhere. You can kind of expect that that set of rules would be um, applicable in the online space as well. So any emergent theory of online speech regulation must acknowledge that, for better or worse, it will not likely be the American understanding of free speech, which is an outlier in its protection um, uh, of, of hate speech and other forms of expression that are impermissible elsewhere, it's unlikely to be that understanding of free speech that will govern online um, around the world. And the challenge lies in identifying whether or to what extent um, uh, online speech regulation is different from offline speech regulation, right? So I said, you know, what, all we're trying to do is take the offline stuff and put it online. Well, maybe that doesn't work because of some uh, features of online speech. Um, once we figured that out, we need to figure out what, you know, how a new regulatory regimes should account for that difference. But that first requires understanding the national and supranational frameworks of speech protections and their respective limits uh, in which regulation of online speech occurs before we can assess the extent to which um, regulation might be compatible across systems. Okay. So you might have noticed that the US has a peculiar way of treating free speech. The First Amendment is usually wielded as kind of a all-purpose weapon when people want to say whatever it is they want to say, right, no matter what it is, um, stupid or racist or, or you name it. Um, and it seems to me that the dominant theory of, of free speech in the online speech discussion is the marketplace theory, which is one of a f couple of standard uh, free speech theories in the US. Um, so we generally attribute this to um, Justice Holmes who said, um, that the best test for truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, right? So what could possibly go wrong in trying to find truth in that way online? Um, there's also a strong notion of First Amendment absolutism in the US, um, which basically means once it's protected uh, as speech, that's the end of the story. Now combine that with internet utopianism or idealism and you can see exactly how we ended up where we are. Um, you also may have noticed that the rest of the world doesn't, uh, doesn't do it that way, or if you haven't noticed, I guess I just told you. Um, 
So US free speech exceptionalism is a pretty noticeable phenomenon in the real world. Um, and Europe, and, and Germany in particular, has a very different attitude towards free speech, and especially hate speech. And I guess you could over, oversimplify and, and say that that's because they've experienced the downside um, most immediately. But that's not really the full story, because there are different First Amendment traditions in the US as well. Um, they just get glossed over uh, in the discussion of online speech regulation. So there, there are First Amendment theories that are built on autonomy, speaker autonomy for the most part, and then there are th uh, theories of democratic self-government that are alternatives to this marketplace conception. And they may, act may actually be more useful uh, when we think about uh, the questions raised by online speech. So despite the fact that the marketplace theory um, and First Amendment absolutism seem to dominate the tech in the tech literature and the online speech literature in the US, we should be a little more careful um, in trying to decide whether we want to adopt that paradigm um, or perhaps we should uh, reconsider. So what do I suggest we do now? I know that I have to, what I have to do now is which is um, wrap, wrap up soon, but um, <laughs> what should we do now? So we start from the premise of a largely, of largely settled arrangements regarding the scope and limits of constitutional speech protection that differ among nations. So I think it's the first step to just start with that premise. Different things exist in the world. Then we try to understand regulatory efforts elsewhere within their constitutional context, and, and I would argue also their historical context. Just be aware of the historical forces that have influenced this constitutional balance. So then we can assess the new legislation in its own constitutional framework. So for Nets DG, that means it may be, it may be running up against uh, domestic constitutional law in Germany, but the point is not that hate speech regulation is imper impermissible. Um, the point is that it may not fit with interpretations of, exist of the existing free speech regime. And there's a large body of court decisions um, interpreting the constitutional provisions and the extent to which uh, criminal provisions can limit speech. So in other words, this has nothing to do with the First Amendment, right? This is a purely uh, domestic, German domestic uh, law question. Um, so then the next step is that this, this, this deep skepticism toward uh, European regulatory efforts may be misguided because it obscures what um, the extent to which regulation might be possible in the US. And so that's the important point we get to when we get to talk about the, the transnational or the global level, because then we have to figure out what is actually um, uh, permissible as, as a regulatory effort um, elsewhere. But we should only be doing that after we understand the regulatory framework at its point of origin. And so I guess the takeaway is we need to we need much deeper engagement, really, um, with the range of free speech theories that already exist in the United States, and we need much deeper engagement with the comparative literature uh, on freedom of expression before we can meaningfully assess challenges of online speech regulation. Thank you.